The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Kainel Wood from the University of British Columbia. He's going to be talking about assessment of concrete column provisions of ASCE 41 using a shaking table to test basis. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks all for coming out. Um, I'm going to uh, follow on from what uh, Wasim was talking about, a uh, similar topic area on, uh, on concrete column provisions. But I'm specifically going to look at the ASC 41 provisions in comparison with a series of shake table tests that have uh, been done um, at uh, both uh, Berkeley uh, through at the Peer Center in the Berkeley lab shake table, as well as at Encre in uh, Taiwan. Um, there's actually seven um, uh, test sets that we'll look at in in, in the entirety, but. I've just shown four here uh, to highlight a few features of these tests. Uh, first of all, you might think that we're testing steel frames, uh, but that's just to catch these, uh, these concrete frames from uh, landing on the table uh, and damaging equipment because almost all of these tests are tested right to collapse. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is that for these top two here, you've got a very large concrete beam on the top. So essentially it's fixed, fixed columns just one story frame. Whereas for these bottom two cases, uh, you've got a frame with uh, flexible beams. And so since the, uh, the available data to us for all of these tests are, are inner story drifts, of course those inner story drifts are affected by those flexible beams in these particular tests. So we'll, we'll um, keep an eye on that. Uh, so as I said, we had uh, seven test sets in total. Uh, but uh, these tests involved uh, frames of different size, different numbers of columns, involved both ductile columns and non-ductile columns in terms of the spacing of the transverse reinforcement. And in the end, we ended up with uh, 21 flexural failures, 33 what we call flexure shear failures, where there's some degree of flexural yielding prior to shear failure, and then only five shear failures that we're looking at. So obviously quite a bit more limited data set than what uh, Professor Ganum was showing you, but uh, still relevant all the same. Uh, so, and as I mentioned, there were two sets in which there was a flexible beam, uh, and uh, we'll take that into account when we, when we focus in on the data. We're, we're really going to focus in more on the data where it's not influenced by that flexible beam to compare with just the modeling parameters for the columns. Uh, just giving you a sense as the, to the cross-section of, of data or the cross-section of the, the properties of the columns, uh, just to highlight a few things, uh, you know, a, a broad range of longitudinal reinforcement ratios, transverse reinforcement, again, a concentration at the, on the non-ductile columns, considering the interest of 369 on the older uh, concrete buildings, uh, that's relevant for us. Another thing I want to point out is that I have two plots for axial load here because, of course, in a shaking table test, you've got uh, variability in axial load, both due to overturning as well as interaction of your components. And so uh, you've got some initial, initial axial load uh, and then uh, some maximum axial load here. And that plays a role in the performance that we see in the, in the test. Uh, just to start off, I'll just give you a glimpse as to a couple of these tests. This was um, one of the tests at Encre, uh, where there was a four-column frame, and here, here we have this stiff beam uh, with two ductile columns and two non-ductile columns. And you might be saying, well, if you're interested in collapse and in uh, older concrete buildings, why do you bother to include these ductile columns? Well, they're important because in a real building, not all components are going to fail at the same time, so we want to simulate that as well we want to allow for some redistribution uh, during failure. So um, late on a Sunday afternoon, I'm sure you'd be interested to see a uh, collapse video. 
So keep an eye here on this uh, column at the top. So in that, in that test, what you saw was initially shear failure opening, uh, shear crack opening up, and then sliding down that shear failure plane. Uh, now I'd like to show you another test. This is the most recent set of tests that were done at ENCRE. Uh, this is a two-story frame. Um, there were a series of tests looking at both joint failures and column failures, but I want to focus in on the high axial load test that was focused on, uh, on the column failures. Um, and uh, this one, uh, there's a very large steel frame there um, that, uh, that gets in the way of you seeing everything. But you can watch that uh, end column uh, during the test. And notice in this case how quickly it fails. So you noticed in that one how quickly it went from a shear failure straight into the axial failure and shortening. Uh, so let's now, uh, this database of course could be used for many different things, but what I'm going to focus on today is application to ASC 41 and how, what it tells us about the backbone model. And that backbone model of course involves an effective stiffness up to yielding, then on to uh, lateral load failure of the element, and then dropping off to, to axial failure. So let's start off by looking at uh, effective stiffness. Uh, this is a, uh, a set of data, uh, actually includes probably many of the columns uh, that uh, Wasim was talking about uh, from the peer column database. Uh, comparing that peer column database to the ASC 41 provisions as well as other provisions for effective stiffness. And what you see is that typically at low axial lows, partic uh, in particular, the, uh, the test data tends to be lower than the ASC 41 limit. That, that actually was intentional in the development of this uh, stiffness provisions for ASC 41. Did not want to underestimate the shear demands on those columns, particularly in their, when, when they are in a wall frame system. Um, but that is the, uh, the trend that you see from a static database. If we look at this smaller, much smaller dynamic database, uh, the effective stiffness values tend to fall in the same range, about 0.2, uh, which is lower than the ASC 41 limit. You compare these two, uh, it's very similar in terms of what it's telling us. Uh, so uh, not too much different from the static to the dynamic database for effective stiffness. And we might be interested in using these dynamic database for looking at the effect of cycles, because of course these columns actually do have the right number of cycles for an earthquake. Um, and if we look at this, uh, what we've done is pulled out the number of cycles that exceed 30% uh, of the maximum shear. And it's difficult to see a trend. If you look at sets of data uh, that are in common test groups, you might see a bit of a trend, uh, but really it's, it's not conclusive. I think further study is really necessary and something that maybe this data set could be used for in the future. So in term, then the next step is to classify your column in terms of its failure mode. And that's done by looking at the uh, shear strength uh, versus the uh, flexural strength. And uh, Wasim was talking about this in his talk. Um, the, uh, the steel contribution to the shear is diminished as the uh, spacing of the transverse reinforcement uh, increases in ASC 41. Um, and as well, there's a... Uh, there's a relationship that many people are familiar with that drops the concrete contribution with, or actually, sorry, that drops the uh, shear strength with uh, ductility demand. And from this, we can say that if you're above uh, VP over V0 of 1, you're most likely a shear failure. If you're between 0.1 and 0.7, the models would tell you that you're a flexural fail flexure shear failure. But ASC 41 says to be conservative, let's lump those all the way down to 0.6 because we don't want to misclassify a flexure shear failure as a flexural failure because then we'll end up giving it too much deformation capacity. Well, if we use this classification scheme, we end up seeing 
a lot of columns that actually are flexure shear failures being classified as shear failures. Uh, and this is perhaps over conservative. And so what we'd like to do is modify the classification scheme to get a better match with the, with the failure modes observed. So first off, we're going to take the advice from uh, Wasim and, and change that uh, the, uh, decrease on the uh, steel contribution to just drop off after 0.75 and then interpolate down to 1. Uh, you could take out that entirely um, as well. And the other thing that we're going to do is that we're going to increase the flexure shear range up to 1.1. And the reason for that is that we end up with a lot of data that's just over one, and we're really penalizing those cases. Um, so with that, we actually get a much better match now uh, with the observed failure modes. So we're classifying these, start off by classifying these columns correctly. Then, once we've classified the columns, we choose the, um, we go into the document and we select an A and a B value, as uh, Wasim was talking about. And so let's talk first about the A value and compare that to when we see lateral load failure in the test. And to do that, we're going to compare the uh, plastic rotation at lateral load failure from the test to the A value within the ASC41 document as a plastic rotation ratio, let's call it. And so if we look at that plastic rotation ratio um, for, all, for all the various different columns, you see a lot of scatter here. But just in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on what's called condition two, which is our flexure shear columns. So focus in on these red diamonds. Um, it shows that uh, ASC41 is fairly conservative for this dynamic database. Uh, if we look at uh, the static database, again, this is similar to the set that uh, Wasim was working with. Um, that we see also conservative, but it's kind of hard to uh, compare overall here. It seems as if perhaps this is uh, somewhat more liberal um, on the uh, static side. So let's uh, compare these in a different way by building a fragility curve. Uh, you can do that by sort of adding up the, the test data um, when they exceed a particular plastic rotation ratio. Then if we do that for both the dynamic set and the static set, what we see is that at a plastic rotation ratio of one, and that's where the test data matches with the uh, ASC41 uh, values, we see a probability of failure of about 15% or so from the static da data set and much, much lower for the dynamic data set. And that 15% probability of failure is actually the target probability of failure uh, from ASC41 supplement one. Um, not a not a coincidence that it's the same data set used. Um, and uh, the dynamic data set is obviously showing a much lower probability of failure. So that means that we're conservative compared to the dynamic data set um, when we look at the SC41 document. So now let's look at axial failure. Again, we're going to look at a plastic rotation ratio. Um, and uh, so now we're focused on the B value. Uh, Axial failure, though, is difficult to define in a dynamic test because uh, the axial load is changing all the time. Um, there's interaction uh, and uh, there are indeterminate systems, so it's actually uh, fairly difficult to define. So we look carefully at all the data and determine that, uh, and uh, with the videos, and uh, determine that we felt that we could ha define axial failure as the point at which you peaked out on your vertical uh, extension of the column just before dropping, just before you got a, a large shortening of the column. And um, so that was our uh, axial failure point we selected. Uh, comparing that axial failure uh, drift to the uh, shear friction model, which is uh, one of the models that um, Wasim uh, referred to, uh, if that curve wasn't there, you'd just say that was a bunch of points on the screen. Uh, there was no trend at all, but maybe that curve makes you think of a trend. Um, it, it's perhaps all right, but certainly not okay for the uh, pure shear failure cases. So, uh, but this model was never developed was developed for flexor shear, so maybe that's not a not too much of a surprise. But it means that we need to pay attention to these pure shear failure cases in terms of their drifted uh, axial failure. Um, if we look at the effect of cycles, again, 
Uh, it's difficult to see a trend with the number of cycles. Um, again, I think this is somewhere the, uh, this data set may be able to provide us with uh, future study. Um, might be able to help with future study. Now let's go to that plastic rotation ratio for axial failure. And again, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus in on the uh, red dots here, which are the uh, flexure shear failures that go all the way to axial uh, failure. And again, you can see it's the ASC41 seems to be conservative as they all line up, uh, almost all line up above one. Um, and uh, and if we compare to a static data set, and as uh, Wasim was saying, there's a much smaller data set available for axial failure. Um, it, as well, is, uh, is conservative. Uh, if we develop those fragility curves again to compare, uh, we see that the static data set and the dynamic data set are actually quite similar. Um, so what this is perhaps implying is that while we're conservative on shear, uh, that allows the, uh, that means that the columns are going to larger drifts at, before shear failure. Uh, we're right on, or almost the same for, um, for axial failure. And so that means that shear and axial are maybe getting closer and closer together for these dynamic tests. So that's potentially a concern. Um, so let me wrap up here. Um, so first of all, I, we identified that the uh, ASC41 overestimates the stiffness for columns with low axial loads. This is similar to what we have seen for uh, static tests and what we uh, expect from ASC41. Um, I'd say that the influence of cycles at this point is inconclusive, uh, and, uh, but I do think it requires some further, care more careful study than what's been done here. Um, we saw that uh, ASC41 is too conservative in its classification of the columns, uh, that too many columns end up getting classified as pure shear failures. So we offered some alternative uh, classification scheme, uh, or perhaps incorporating VP over V0 into the calculation of those uh, A and B terms, as suggested by uh, Professor Ganum. Uh, and then we saw that for the flexure shear columns, the, the set that we had the most information for, that the dynamic, that the drift at shear failure from the dynamic data set was larger than the drift at shear failure for the static data set. But uh, at axial failure, they were very, very close to being the same, uh, implying that the, the difference between axial and shear failure is perhaps less for a dynamic test. It makes sense. As the column starts to blow out, it uh, has inertial forces that carry it forward uh, toward axial failure, and you observe that in the second video at least. Um, and so suggesting that, yes, we may be conservative in our assessment of shear failure, but also that we may have a limited reserve uh, beyond shear failure before axial failure of columns. All right, with that, I say thank you and uh, invite any questions.